Most historians agree that the events leading to the Battle of Whiskey Hills and the subsequent disaster at Quicksand Bottoms began here in Denver at a miners' meeting. Such meetings were frequent and held usually as part of the political fabric of the town. But the meeting of November 4th had a marked air of grim foreboding. Quiet, I got an announcement I got to make. Quiet, I got an announcement I got to make. In 10 days from now, the city of Denver will be bone dry. No! Not one drop of whiskey anywhere. So what we need, we need us a plan. Hey, what does Oracle say? Oracle, what about this here winter? What else? Have you seen anything else? Yep, I uh, had me evasion and, uh, oh, come on me two days ago. Well, uh, what was it? What did uh, you see? Uh, oh. all right, thank you. At the feed store, it was. I come on more sudden than most. I was looking up, and uh, there it was. What was it? Snow. Heavy, white snow. Yep, it's going to be a long, hard winter, and when a long, hard winter hits us, by damn, she hits. No wagons getting through, no supplies? And no whiskey. You know. Yep. Come on me two days ago. we got to have a plan. Yeah. What kind of plan, Oracle? Uh, now, let me just... Uh, oh, thank you. Now I see it. There, now I see it, yeah. <laughs> uh, how many of you seen that movie? Hallelujah Trail. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. It's really good. <laughs> I heard a pastor who decided to do something a little bit different one Sunday morning, and he said, you know what? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to shout out a single word, and what I want you to do is you know just somebody start singing to him. We'll just sing at him together, you know. So he he said cross. Well, of course, first thing somebody did was stand up and start start singing down at the cross, you know, say thou sang the song, you know, that kind of stuff. And he, when he got done with that, when he hollered grace, well, somebody started saying, amazing grace, you know, and they went, you know, all that kind of stuff. So finally he said, well, he said, well, how about the word power? Well, then they started singing, well, power in the blood you know there's power there's power power in the book and then, so he after that got done with that one he said sex well you know of course the whole place was silent for you know a few minutes and pretty soon one little old lady about 87 years old in the back row stood up and said precious memory <laughs> <laughs> yeah well anyway <laughs> Uh, let me just welcome you to week number one of our brand new series called Awakening the Dreamer, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in this series, what we're going to be talking about is how we can, ses can successfully arrive at the place with that we'd like to be sometime in the future. You know, they, they, you know it's, good, it's a good thing to lay down some plans and to know where you're going, whether it's a year from now or five years from now or ten years from now or whatever the case might be. So let me just kind of ask you then, where, where are we? I don't mean physically, but I mean where are we? Uh, and how did we get here? And, and what is possible for our future here at, at gracelife.tv? And, and how do we get there? You know, all those are important questions that we need to talk about, that we need to ask, that we need to kind of look into and decide where we are, where we've been, what we're up to, what, what we plan to, where we plan to be in the future, all those kind of things. But you know what, if no clear uh, images come to mind, uh, don't worry about it because God already has a plan. God already has a plan. He's got things uh, lined out, and uh, not only for you as an individual, but also for us as a body of, of Christ here in this particular place. 
You know, I've said, I've said it a hundred different ways, or it's been said a hundred different ways, that, you know, uh, you, you can't stay on track if you don't know what track you're on, right? Or, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. You know, all those different kind of things. You know, you can't get there if you don't know where there is. So it, it's important that we kind of understand or we kind of have a plan in mind as to where, where we're going, what we're doing, what we're up to. But I think, you know, uh, a Im more important question probably is, is there where you want to be when you finally arrive, right? If, is that where you really want to be? Uh, they say that a failure to plan is a plan to fail. I'd say that's probably true. You know, if we don't plan, then any road will get you, know, any road will get you there. So if you plan to fail and you do, have you been successful? Yeah. That's what I've heard. You must be successful. <laughs> if you failed the plan and you failed, I guess you were successful. Um, you know, nature has a way of filling a vacuum. Uh, I don't think a vacuum is necessarily one of those things that can really exist. If you take something out, something else is going to move in. Uh, you know, and those kind of things. And the chance that that something, that whatever it is that fills the vacuum in your life is going to be where you want to go or what you want to do or what you actually expected are probably about as great as the chances of winning the lottery, about a hundred million to one. You know, if you've got a vacuum in your life, you're not sure where you're going, what you're up to, the chances that whatever it is that fills that void is going to be what you want it to be are, are very, very slim, probably a hundred million to one, kind of like the lottery. And from what I've heard, your chances are even less than that if you don't buy a ticket. Uh, of course, Sheldon says that the real miracle, he's been praying that God would, uh, would, would, ha would cause him to lend, win the lottery. And I asked him, did you buy a ticket? He said, well, no. He said, the real miracle is, is that I'll walk out into the parking lot in Wally World and find a ticket laying on the ground and it'll be the winning ticket. You know, <laughs> then I know that God's really in it, right? You know? <laughs> So, you know, yeah, you, you, I think you understand. Um, so the fact is, unless we have a plan for where we're going to go, where we want to go, unless we have a dream for where we want to be in the future and what we want to accomplish along the way, it's really going to be impossible to really arrive at our de destination. If you don't have a destination to arrive at, how are you going to get there, right? You've got to have a dream. You've got to have a destination. Uh, so let me just say to you as, you as we begin here today that, you know, God has assembled a dream team of believers here at gracelife.tv that support this ministry physically and emotionally and spiritually and financially. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, like everything else in this world, finances are necessary in order to keep a place running. And that's what it takes here as well. And if you'd like to join that team of givers, we'd just love to have you. And we certainly could use you as, as well. You can make your donation online or you can just put it in the box there in the back. We don't pass a plate here because we're not trying to force anybody into doing anything or feel you, make you feel guilty for not giving. You give as God has laid it upon your heart to give. And if you don't give, that's between you and God. Not me and you and God, but just between you and God. And nobody, it's nobody else's business. I'll tell you right up front, as I've told you many times before, I don't know who gives. And I don't want to know who gives. Because that would, I, I, just, I just feel like that might uh, taint how I feel or how, what, you know, how I relate to people. So I don't want to know. I don't want to know if you give or don't give or how much you give or all those kind of things. I just don't care. You give if you want to give and it's between you and God. Uh, and also the people that handle our finances here at gracelife.tv are the same way. I've talked to them about the same thing. They're not going to tell you who gives and who doesn't give. Uh, as a matter of fact, when they do the papers and that kind of stuff, uh, they just uh, uh, just do the, do the numbers, don't even pay attention to who it came from, other than having to write it down and have a record of it. Other than that, you know, you're, you're safe. So, okay, so God says in Proverbs 28, or 29, 18, He said, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. You've probably heard that in some other ways, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But the first word I want you to see here is the word vision. The first word I want to draw your attention to is the word vision. Uh, what does it mean to have a vision? There are a lot of different meanings in English, right? To have a vision. I mean, uh, we, could, we might think it might be a vision like Oracle had uh, here in this clip, video clip we watched a minute ago from, uh, from Hallelujah Trail. You know, yeah, I see it. You know, angels are singing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, that, that would be one kind of a vision. 
Or maybe it's like the visions they had in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets had, or like Moses, you know, when he saw, when he talked to God in the burning bush, that would be kind of a vision, right? A lot of different things in that, in that respect. But actually the word vision in this particular passage is a Hebrew word that literally means to have a dream. Uh, and not just a dream that you have in the middle of the night. <laughs> I think we all do that. But a dream for the future, that's what he's talking about here. It's not a dream like you might have at night, uh, like those kind of things. But you know what, if you look, and as a matter of fact, if you look up the word vision in the Unger's Bible Dictionary, which I did, I thought, well, I'll just kind of see what they have to say. Well, you know what it says? It says, see dream. <laughs> Doesn't even have anything under vision. It says, see dream, you know. And so you go look at dream, and sure enough, that's what he talks about there. Um, I think Martin Luther King is the one who kind of said it, you know, kind of said it best or remembered best for that famous statement that's where he said, I have a dream, right? Well, we knew that he, his, the dream that he had was not something that he dreamt up in the middle of the night. It wasn't, uh, you know, a vision from God or those kind of things. He had a dream for the future, right? That's what this kind of a dream is talking about. That's what it's about here in Proverbs 29, 18. Um, and matter of fact, so important is it for us to have a dream that God says specifically in this verse that without a dream, the people perish. Uh, that's, King, that's King James that says perish. And it should be, yeah. Uh, without a dream, the people perish. Uh, unrestrained is a pretty good word, I guess, but uh, there's a lot of different ways of saying that. So let me ask you this question. How many of you guys, how many of you had a dream uh, for your, your life when you were a child? How many of you kind of looked at the future and had a, a dream, you know, something that you looked forward to, wanted to happen? I think we probably all did in one form or another, you know. Uh, we all had an idea of where we wanted to be, maybe what we wanted to be when we grew up, uh, you, know, uh, you know, where we wanted to live, uh, maybe what kind of house we wanted to live in. Uh, I remember one of the guys that, in high school that I graduated with, uh, and, and his dream was, I remember was to have, and that was back in 1973, don't do the figures, but he said that, I can remember that last year, because the K5 Blazer, Chevy K5 Blazer came out that year, you know, that four-wheel drive uh, Blazer, and he said, when I grow up, so when, I get, when I get money, that's the first vehicle I'm going to have. I want a K5 Blazer, you know. Well, I want to do a little four-wheel drive pickup myself, you know. For, back then, four-wheel drive was really cool. Uh, there weren't that very many four-wheel drives that you could buy. They were just finally first coming on the market. But I think we all have a dream for where we want to be, what we want to do, uh, what we might have, want to have in our lives, all those different kind of things. Okay, so the second word I want to draw your attention to is that word translated as unrestrained in the New American Standard. Uh, it's also... Ca uh, 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 Translated as cast off restraint in the Revised Standard Version. Uh, Living Bible translated as run wild. <laughs> okay. Or, or even some, some translations have lack discipline. Uh, that's probably a good one as well. And actually the word perish in the King James Version uh, really has very little to do with what this is about. It's a very poor translation. King James uh, uh, translating that as perish is a very poor translation because it really has nothing to do with what this word, this word actually means. It has nothing to do with, you know, perish. When we think of perish, we think of, you know, you're going to die and go to hell, you know. If you don't have this vision, if you don't have a vision from God, if you don't have a dream, you're going you're gonna to die and go to hell, buddy, you know. No, it has, has nothing to do with it at all. Nothing at all. However, it is about... Uh, not having a direction in your life. You know, if you don't have a dream, then you really don't have a direction for your life. You don't really know where you're going. If you don't know where you're going, you can't get there. You know, um, it's a lot like uh, pushing on the gas pedal and, and not ever touching the steering wheel. Because when you do that, if you, if you push on the gas pedal, certainly you're going to go somewhere, aren't you? And depending on how fast you push on the gas pedal, you're going to get there faster. But the fact is, is that what God is telling us here is that without a 
I'll say it this way, this way, without a vivid mental image for who we are, where we're going, what we want to accomplish along the way, how we plan to get there, the car we're in is going to be directed only by the bumps in the road, by the ruts that other people made in front of us, you know, by the, by the sharp rocks that flatten our tires along the way. If we don't know where we're going, how we're going to get there, and a plan for getting there, then we just as well be in a car pushing on the gas pedal without a steering wheel. Because we're, all we're going to do is bump along, and, and the bumps that we come to are going to decide which direction we go at that particular time, right? And you, and you never know where you're going to end up at. When my daughter was probably five or six years old, and, and maybe even younger than that, she, uh, I was working for the U.S. government at the time, and of course I brought my family with me. I worked out on the big ranches in the northern, northern uh, part of New Mexico, and uh, she, she often wanted to drive. Of course, she'd just, you know, she'd stand in my lap and could just barely see over the steering wheel, you know, so she was holding the steering wheel like this. And I'd run the, I'd run the pedals while she'd do the steering. She learned to drive like that. She was actually a really good driver, still is. Um, but, you know, uh, when I let her drive like that, we were, dri we were out on the big ranch uh, and, uh, and just two, uh, two rut road. And matter of fact, in you know, one spot there, the ruts were really, really deep. I mean, they were, they were real deep. And I told her, and the ground was dry. I told her, I said, you got to stay out of those ruts. You know, you got to stay out of those ruts. You got to stay out between the ruts. You know, you had a rut here between your tires and one out to the south side. I said, you got to stay out of those ruts, you know. So she was steering along, and of course, be, you know, a heavy pickup and her being a little girl, it finally drug her off into the ruts. Boom, there we were, you know. And we were high centered. Uh, all four wheels were off the ground on a four wheel drive pickup. You know, it was okay. We were young, no big deal. You know, we had, we had time on our hands and, you know, that was an adventure, you know. Uh, she, of course, it scared her, but uh, it was okay. I got out, took the handyman jack. If you all know what a handyman jack is, a high lift jack. I jacked the bumper up on the front end, you know, up as high as I could get it and then just pushed the pickup over to get it out of the ruts because uh, there wasn't any other way to get it out of those particular ruts. And, and we got out, you know. But you know, the fact is, is that in life, if all you're doing is pushing on the gas pedal and not holding on the steering wheel, you're going to end up in the ruts. You could high center, you could, you could, you, and once you get in ruts, if they're not, you're not going to high center, it's hard to get out of them, isn't it? You ever been in ruts? If you haven't ever been in ruts, you, you, then you need to know. Once you get in those ruts, it's hard to get out of them. They just take you wherever the, last, first, the person ahead of you went, doesn't matter. You, if, you, if they ended up in the ditch, you're going to end up in the ditch, right? And, and that's when it's dry. If it's wet, it's going to be about the same way. If it's muddy out there, it's going to be about the same way. You get in those ruts, it's hard to get out of them when it's slick. It really is. So we've, we've got to know where we're going. We've got to have a plan for getting there. We've got to know where it is that God wants us to be. So that, let me also say that just like all other biblical principles, and I'm going to call it that because... Because biblical principles also apply in the secular world, don't they? I mean, the secular world comes up with these great ideas, right? And, and all they're doing is they're just discovering what the Bible already said. That's all they're doing. They're, they're just discovering what the... If they looked at the Bible first, they'd, have, they'd already know that to begin with. But the secular world does the same kind of thing. It applies in both worlds, secular as well as the religious world or spiritual world. Um, every business today knows, already knows, they're already based on the fact that you must have a dream. You've got to have a dream. You've got to have a mission, you know, a plan of attack, if you, if you want to call it that. Uh, because that mission, that vision, that plan of attack keeps them on track and going forward toward their, their goal, you know, uh, toward that preset goal. Then it becomes a preset goal, not just something that you just, you know, thought about along the way. Matter of fact, that's exactly why uh, businesses like Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby are in trouble right now. They have a mission. They have a, a vision for who they are and where they want to be and with the kind of business they want to be, and they're sticking to that. Uh, thank God they're sticking to their guns, you know, but they're getting in trouble for it, aren't they? Well, same thing. They know what their vision is. They know what their mission is. They've got this plan of attack and they're going for it. Doesn't matter what anybody else says. And it shouldn't matter what anybody else says. It's their business. It's their business. 
Not the government's business. This is our business, not the government's business. You know? Uh, we are who we are. And certainly the government tries, or sometimes tries to tell us what to do and what not to do. But you know what? Uh, we're going to follow what God tells us to do. doesn't matter. However, the major difference between the secular world and the spiritual world is the fact that if we, as a body of believers in Jesus Christ, are going to be able to enjoy the, the awesome blessings that God has in mind for us in our future, the dream that we have must be a dream that God has given us. The dream that we have has to be a dream that God has given us. And not simply something that we dreamed up on our own. You know, we'd say, well, oh, we'd like to do this, or we'd like to do that. Well, how's God feel about that, you know? H have, we, have we asked God where He wants us to be and what He has in mind for us? Because only in that way uh, will we truly be a relevant and life-changing agent within our community and throughout the world. If we're directed and guided by God, not just by our own interests. That's when we become this life-changing agent in our community and around the world. So the question is, does, here's an important question. I've asked this question before and I'm asking you again. Does this church have anything relevant and or life-changing to offer this community in our world? Let me say that a different way. Uh, is there anything so different about this body of believers uh, that that the regular person couldn't find somewhere else in another church. Or, if you want to say it another way, what makes us unique from other churches? Right? I mean, if we're not different from other people, then, uh, hey, go anywhere. It doesn't matter. Because you can find anything you want out there. It's out there. Uh, and most of it ain't that, ain't that good. Uh, is what we offer here any different or more significant than what a person could find in any other denomination or religious organization? Well, the answer is an emphatic yes. We do. And that's exactly what this church was founded on. Not just becoming a church, you know, or not just um, extending the uh, reaches of a particular denomination because we're not attached to anybody else and, and with good reason and with good reason uh, I've told you before I, I served in a uh, one of the nation's largest uh, denominations for, for about 18 years as pastor and I can tell you for absolute fact that uh, in the denominational setting, you will go the direction they tell you to go. Uh, you try to get out of that box, you're going to be in trouble. Well, it happened. I got in trouble. <laughs> because I wasn't going to follow what the denomination said. I was going to follow what God says in His Word, not what the nom denomination says that God says in His Word. You know? There's a big difference there. Uh, and, and the difference is a very important difference, as a matter of fact. The fact is, from the very beginning, GraceLife.tv, this particular organization, has readily embraced the vision that God has given us. That God not only set before us in the very beginning, but has literally called us to. And He's brought us through lots of stuff, let me tell you. We're not here by accident. <laughs> because in the beginning, we, if you were there in the beginning, you, should, you would know. You, you already know, we should not exist. We should not exist. Because we were highly outnumbered. And, and the fact is, with the vision and the dream, the, the mission that God has given us, uh, we stick to that as well. So that today, every ministry and every program and every event and every worship experience and every message is filtered through that vision. Because we're staying on track with what God has called us to do here. We're not getting off track. <laughs> we're, we're sticking with what God called us to do at the beginning. And it's that single fact that not only enables us to stay on track with what God has called us to do, but also provides us with the insight and the courage to call out those things that don't fit. 
You know, they aren't necessarily bad in, the, in and of themselves because there's lots of stuff we do. It's not, it's not a bad thing to do. It's no big deal. But does it get us toward the goal that God has called us to? So there certainly are things that keep us from being as effective as we could be. If it's not being effective, hey, throw it out. We'll start, we'll try something else. We'll do something else. No big deal. No hurt feelings. You know, not, not stepping on any toes. We're just saying, hey, it wasn't effective. It's okay. Don't feel bad about it. We'll, we'll do something else. We'll try something else, you know. So exactly what is it? What is the dream that God has given us to, to this particular body of believers? We'll look at it. Let's look at it again. We've looked at this before. We are expecting God to work through us to help thousands of people find freedom from the, from, I should say, from the fear of the law of sin and of death through the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, there's a word left out there. That's okay. We are expecting God to work through us to help thousands of people find freedom from the fear of the law of sin and of death through the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that sounds like a mouthful, but there's a, and it is. There's a lot there, a lot there than what you might first imagine, and it's very important and very to the point. It's very to the point. Uh, way back when I was probably four or five years old, may have been six, I don't know, I doubt it, I remember being in this kind of a dirty, uh, dirt brown, yeah, that's, that's a picture, that's it. Uh, if that's a, anybody know what that is? Studebaker Thank you very much. A Studebaker Lark. Uh, I doubt that it was new uh, when, my, when my dad bought it. It probably was a used uh, car. But we were, I was with my dad one day, and we were headed for, we lived in Nebraska, a place called Hayes Center. I mean, you heard of Hayes Center. All right, all right, you got one, one Nebraskan back there. It's a spot in the road that probably had, I don't know, 50 or 60 people living in at the time. Uh, and and uh, McCook was probably, I don't know, 40 miles away or so. And in those days, and especially during the summertime, and in a car like this, 40 miles was a long ways. That was a long ways away. And Dad and I were headed over there to McCook for some reason. I don't know, I have any idea why. I don't, I don't know. That's not part of my mem memory. Uh, but I do remember on the way back home, what Dad told me, he said, in the glove box, how many of you know what a glove box is? Yeah, okay, or a cubby hole, how many call it the cubby hole? All right, what else do you call it? That's, that's it, huh? Glove box, okay, glove box, all right. So you know what I'm talking about, that glove box, cubby hole, whatever it is on in front of the passenger seat. And he said, he said, open that thing up. So I did, there was a sack in there. And he said, open that sack. I opened the sack. And what was in there was orange slices, candy orange slices. And uh, it was hot summertime. Of course, they were pretty sticky. And, you know, there, there wasn't any air conditioning back then. There wasn't any such thing as air conditioning. You all know that. Or some of you know that. And, and so Dad says, well, get you one. So I did. I got me one. Boy, it was good. Man, it was good. He said, well, get you another one. I go, all right. Said, sure, man. <laughs> you know, so I got me another one. And then he just kind of said, well, you know, eat, eat what you want. It's okay. Eat what you want. So I did. Well, it wasn't long before I was kind of like going, you know, it was hot in the summertime. And boy, I didn't feel good at all. I mean, I, I didn't feel good at all. Now, I'm not, I don't puke. Y'all want to know that, didn't you? <laughs> and I didn't. But, you know, I was sick as a dog, man. I was sick as a dog. And, and ever since that day, I, you know, I, I can remember what an orange slice tastes like. I've got a very vivid memory of what an orange slice tastes like. But I haven't ate one since that day. <laughs> I had more than I wanted on that day. They tasted good in the, in the beginning, but by the time I got done, I don't want one ever again. <laughs> I don't have any desire for an orange candy orange slice, even to this day, you know. I don't. Uh, and the reason I tell you that is because uh, not only was the bag full of, you know, this good, sweet, wonderful candy at the time, but Dad let me eat as many as I wanted to without stopping me. Uh, so even though I don't think I could ever stand to eat another one of those ever possibly nasty things again, <laughs> Uh, I also, it also is a very fond memory, right? Because not only did Dad surprise me with this, 
you know, wonderful gift, this delicious candy. But he also allowed me to learn a very important lesson at a very early age. And that is personal restraint. Now, you remember we read just a minute ago that some translations say, without a vision, people cast off restraint. You can run off in all directions at the same time. I don't know how you do that, but you can. <laughs> you can head off in a direction and it'd be the wrong direction. Uh, and so I tell you that story because it reminds me of a story that Jesus told in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus compares us earthly fathers to himself by saying, if then being evil, and he's not saying that we're all evil, he's just saying that we're not God, right? Know how to give good gifts to your children, which my dad did, right? That was a really good gift. A whole bag of orange slices, eat as many as you want. They're good, you know? Of course, he ate a few, but he had a little more restraint than I did. If we know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to you to those who to ask Him, right? God, if we know how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more does God then know how to give us good gifts? Things that are good for us. He wants to do that. He wants to do that. He's not withholding it because we're not being good. Dad didn't ask me, have you been good today? You know, like Santa Claus, you better be good, you better not try. No, that's not who God is. That's not who God is. God doesn't wait for you to get good enough before he gives you good gifts. That's not it. If we know how to give good gifts to our kids, and God certainly knows how to give, give good gifts to His kids. So why did Jesus say that? I mean, what caused Jesus to make this particular comparison? Well, if you, if you back up uh, to, Matthew, uh, to verse 7 in Matthew 7, it, He's saying, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. He's saying, listen, uh, God has all these good, good gifts to give to you. you. All you have to do is ask for it. I think we fail sometimes to do that. Uh, if we just ask God, if we talk to God about these things, we can realize that Jesus desires, God desires to not only reveal His will to us, but to also cause us to know what He has planned for our lives. He's not hiding that plan. He's not keeping that from us, waiting for us to get good enough before He tells us about it. He's not asking us, well, were you a good boy this year? And then I'll decide whether you deserve a good present or a bad present. No, that's not who God is. But He's wanting to, and He's trying to even, reveal to us what is possible for our future, and then to give us the strength and the wisdom and the knowledge to know how to get there. And to give us all those good things along the way as well. That's who God is. So I got to tell you, it brings, and you need to hear this, it brings great pleasure to the heart of God to open new doors of opportunity for us. Does it not give you great pleasure for your friends and your family and your kids to open doors of opportunity for them and say, listen, Here's what you can do. Let me show you how to do this. Right? To open that door and then, do, and, and then, and then just sit back and smile as you watch it walk through and become successful. Is God any different than us? No. God is, is that much better than us. <laughs> it really makes God happy to be able to open doors of opportunity for us to walk through. And all we need to do is just to simply ask for His blessing, seek His will, and then walk through those doors of opportunity that He opens before us. That's what God wants to do for us. Okay, so here's a question. What does God have plans for our, what, 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 is, what are God's plans for our future? Well, uh, He tells us directly in Jeremiah 29, 11, He says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. He's saying, here it is, I'm telling you, and I'm not asking you, I'm not pretending, I'm telling you. I'm declaring this, that the plans I have for you are plans for, no, not to live off welfare. <laughs> no, 
No, it's for your good. <laughs> good things for you. And not for your calamity. Not bad things, but to give you a future and a hope. That's what God's plan is for our lives. And yet so many times we are taught, especially in religious circles, that listen, God, God's waiting for you to get good enough, you know. Or the reason you're not, you're not being blessed is because you've been, been a bad person. No, that's Santa Claus. You got Santa Claus mixed up with God. God says, I have these plans for you and they're all good plans for you. To give you hope and a future. To give you good things, not bad things. That's who God is. As a matter of fact, uh, God's plan is and has always been to bless our lives beyond imagination. Well, well why? Because the Bible tells us that the Lord is a warrior. And, and the Lord being a warrior has already fought and, the, and won the battle for our freedom. He's already fought and won the battle for our freedom. We don't have to fight to be free. We are free in Jesus Christ so that we might live in the glorious freedom of Him, of His big G grace. That's what God's about. That's who God is. And all we need to do is look to Him and, and, and walk through those doors of opportunity that He gives us and not be afraid. God's awesome. The Lord is a warrior. He has already won our freedom for us. Lord bless you all. Amen. Give God a hand.